Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Mark and Mike Patey are here. It's going to be so much fun to hear about their story and uh, everything that's been going on in the past and is coming in the future as well. Before we get started, as always, a few housekeeping notes. Tonight's broadcast will be recorded, will be available directly at socialflight.com in the Social Flight mobile app, as well as on our YouTube channel. Just search one word, Social Flight. And with that, I'd like to also remind everyone that we created Social Flight for you. We, it's completely free. It's dedicated to supporting general aviation by putting together tens of thousands of aviation events and webinars, destinations, so many things that we hope you use in order to get out there and fly. And that's because our community is not just a small one and one that we are passionate about, but it's also a vulnerable one. And we created the series of Social Flight Live in order to be able to support all of you during these challenging times to bring together some of the most wonderful personalities and inspiring individuals within general aviation. Now, during the show, you can post questions using the Q&A feature. We won't be asking questions directly from there, but you'll see me looking over there on a regular basis, and I'll try to fit those into our discussion as much as possible. And so uh, with that, I'd like to get started now. The Patey brothers are modern legends of aviation in their accomplishments in the air and on the ground. Since the age of 15, both Mark and Mike have been successful serial entrepreneurs, both on and off the airport. They built an RV6A, RV10, Turbo Zenith 801, a Carbon Cub, Murphy Rebel, Turbine Comp Air 8, I have to take breaths, there are so many aircraft in here, a Turbine Epic LT, three Lancer Legacies, and Turbulence, the only Turbine Legacy ever built which Mark used to break the transcontinental world speed record once held by Howard Hughes. And, um, you know, Mike, of course, he's the one that's the creator of Draco, the coolest stall aircraft ever built, and that is until his new creation, Scrappy, gets airborne. And of course, both brothers founded Best Tugs and have managed to turn what used to be a necessary evil uh, in an aircraft for just moving aircraft around a hangar into a high tech work of art and actually a status symbol for general aviation. And I can tell everyone here, Social Flight's B5 tug is on order and we cannot wait for it to arrive. Welcome, Mark and Mike Patey. How are you guys doing tonight? Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> oh, I, I really appreciate it. Mark, Mike. <laughs> So I'll go left to right, because I know that's the first question I'm going to get from everybody is is who's who on that. So, yes, exactly. Mike on the left, Mark on the right. We're good to go. So um, <clears throat> now I'd like to begin before we get too lost in things with the, the history. Now, you guys, your your success starts way back beginning at age 15. Tell me a little bit about how the two of you as brothers uh, got motivated it, both in business and then how that connected to aviation. So um, when we were uh, growing up a big family, we uh, really had to learn how to work. Everyone pitched in to feed 11 children, a family of 13, both in the same parents. And uh, no money. No money. <laughs> we grew up. <laughs> we could tell you all the, the, the poor jokes and they would all be accurate. Yeah. Hand me down um, clothes from older sisters and all, <laughs> all the teasing that came with the bell bottom plaid pants that obviously were girls' pants. That was our upbringing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we loved every minute of it. But uh, as we got older, um, our parents just taught us how to work. And more importantly, they taught us to love to work and to just find joy in it. And uh, that's held us with us our whole lives. And at 15, uh, our dad went blind, and he was a sign painter who originally hand-painted signs before you could print them and would put the sales at all the local grocery stores in the windows. And, and up on the freeway billboard signs, you know, yeah. if you can believe that, there used to be guys standing up on those billboards painting. Painting those oh are God. called sign writers. And, uh, you know, if you're raising a family as big as ours and go blind, um, that gets tough. That gets tough. Oh and that's God, I didn't of, know that. That's that. That must have been so so hard on you guys. You know, we <laughs> didn't know. It was not that big of a deal. My dad was so positive. He genuinely just happy and just cared about everybody else so much that you never really heard him complain. 
it would just, you notice him start bumping into things and it getting worse and worse over time until he was officially completely blind. And uh, his attitude was always positive and that he would always get it back someday. And in the meantime, um, we'd all step it up and work. And that's when Mark and I started a, a company. We actually built a deck on the back of our house for our oldest sister's wedding with couldn't, couldn't with, afford a reception center. So <laughs> <laughs> we built a little deck uh, with our dad. And uh, that became a photo we carried door to door for months. We were we were 15 and we looked 12. And so uh, that's how we started. Runt twins. Runt twins for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it actually wasn't tough. We like Mike says, we didn't know we were poor. We we thought it was weird that uh, we were the only people in the neighborhood that had to mix powdered milk to make cereal, or that we had to mix powdered eggs to make eggs. We thought everybody did that. As you got older, you started realizing, wait. You don't mix eggs out of powder? For, like you actually crack it. You can afford those eggs that you crack in a pan. But we we never we, we, we never were, we were so happy. We yeah. had we had more than we could ever. Ignorance is bliss. We had a great family, and and that's the only thing that mattered anyway. So yeah, we wow. never. And so that was the beginning of of a series of companies. So basically, you couldn't afford a deck for your sister's wedding, and so you decided, hmm, I'm going to start a multi million dollar business instead. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, that's about what it is. That and we wanted a three-wheeler, a Honda 185S that a neighbor had that was beat up and used, and we wanted a really, 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 really bad. And that was motivation enough to knock doors for a yeah, long time. Yeah, we, we would knock doors until that business worked so that we could uh, make payments of, I think, $50 a month for $850. <laughs> and uh, Sometimes you just need a, a good motivator. <laughs> Once no food for the family, three wheeler that the neighbor has for sale, and uh, ignorance. Uh, we were too stupid to know we were too young to start a company and and uh, succeed. So we got lucky and pulled it off. I love that necessity actually drives that, or passion actually drives that in terms of what you want. Because you know, uh, I, I was having a similar discussion recently. Uh, in fact, we talked about it with Rob Machado that. There's there's these two different philosophies, and I know you you both speak a lot about the philosophy of success. And some people have this approach of you do what you can afford, and and other people have one of no. If if you get a passion, if you get a taste for something that you can't afford, then that's what drives people to then find a way to make it happen. That you know the that's idea right. of exposing people. Uh, to things that are way out of their comfort zone or out of their financial ability actually might inspire them to find a way to make it happen. Yeah, I, I agree completely. You know, when we were getting ready to get our first car, um, they took two vehicles to drive our family around. Um, it, was, it was the size of the family. And we were going to get, the, the car we were going to drive was a diesel rabbit that blew so much smoke, the cars behind you couldn't see. I mean, it was the <laughs> most broke down thing, rough bucket you'd ever seen. I don't know how it was still run. And we knew that was going to be the car we would drive occasionally. And uh, we asked our dad if we could put a Jetta GLI hopped up motor in it. And he says, you can do whatever you'd like. If you promise once you start the project, you'll never stop every minute of every day till it's done. And that was uh, our parents taught us, you know, okay, if we don't have the money to buy the engine. But since we don't have the money, well, first step is go get the money. So go work hard and get the money. When you get the money, buy the engine. When you get the engine, dad would agree to put it in the garage and let us disassemble and my parents we must have caused a holy terror for them because then the whole family would be <laughs> every every two tool trips, left and left. Two, two trip in the other vehicle to get the family somewhere but that's how supportive of our parents were they, wow. they said you anything you want if you're willing to work hard enough to go get it and, and uh it was it was the greatest blessing for us to have that i, I think the real grief was with that was uh is that we got that uh, engine running in that car before we had before we turned 16 and had our driver's license. We might have snuck it <laughs> out. <laughs> Being a mild, shy kids, we somehow mustered up the courage to fire it up and burn around town. <laughs> Oh, so man. basically, in, at least when you were doing it uh, the right way, you had already gone and done all this work, and then you had to ride in the back seat? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. That's when we learned um, a lot about literally engine wiring. There's no computers at the time. We, we, we pulled out manuals. My dad said, if you don't know how to do wiring, get a book. And so we bought every book for every Volkswagen. Um, and Some of you remember books. those thick books you could get at the auto parts store. We, we bought the, the books. We had to learn how to read wiring diagrams yeah. at 
almost 16 to figure out how to make a fuel injected GTI motor work in a diesel rabbit. And um, so that was, but that was another thing. You don't know how to wire a car. You don't know how to put together a fuel injection system in a car that was never meant to have it. And if you're motivated and uh, you don't have money to pay someone else to do it, well, you might actually just go get an education. Turns out education is usually free if you're motivated. That's an interesting thing. I mean, was this essentially the essence of the mechanical ability that, that you know, fast forwards you to all the different things that both of you do? It would have been, it would have been when we, we bicycles, learned. go karts. Yeah, when right we were before the cars, we were rebuilding motors for home built go karts. Our, our parents, I don't know what age they would say it was before we were born. They said the worst time experience they uh, had was when both of us figured out what a Phillips and a flathead was. <laughs> we actually took things apart. We did. We disassembled everything in the house, and it was. Uh, I mean, we would sneak. We wanted. To, we wanted to know how everything worked, and, and so <laughs> if our parents were gone. This is no joke. We pulled apart the, the family only vacuum cleaner, and we <laughs> hooked the motor up to a skateboard, and we would run it up and down the driveway until the cord would unplug. And that was <laughs> when we were teeny, teeny, teeny. But then we'd get home. Before, before that was the. Uh, <laughs> the before that. The, the vacuum cleaner terror story was, we've never told these stories public. This is kind of fun. Exactly uh, what we're here for. Keep going. Related here, but, but before the vacuum cleaner, that was the genesis of the vacuum cleaner coming apart was the original thing that drug our skateboard across the driveway was so slow. And that's that we had taken apart the electric can opener. You push it, wah, 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 wah. Well, yeah. we had taken that apart and hooked it to a rope and we'd just sit in the driveway with a long message, go wah wah. It's a long, just oh, the <laughs> driveway, and then it's like we need a bigger motor. <laughs> so <laughs> the line motor was gone. We were very, very little when we were doing that. It was a lot of fun, and we yeah. wanted a go kart. We couldn't afford one. That's when we learned how to weld. When we were, I don't know, nine years old, maybe we we learned how we to were weld. Welding at nine years old. Yeah, yeah we had a scout leader that we had just started with that owned an auto body shop, uh, Neelaman, um, I want to say Neelaman. Um, and uh, he had an auto body repair place and he knew how to weld stuff and we were trying to figure out the go-kart things and, and we convinced him to weld something for us and then weld it again and weld it again and kept breaking it and then finally he helped us run the welder. So. That's amazing. Wow. We so you so get good at welding until sometime in our forties, but <laughs> well, <laughs> we're, we're still working on still it. Working. Ask any welder. Nobody can weld except for the welder, right? If you you can have a great weld, but another welder will look at it and go, the penetration doesn't look good. So I've just learned <laughs> I got too much heat in that. I'm no good, but it'll hold. No, you know what's great? <laughs> if I if I do I do welds that go online. It's fantastic because I can show my best one. Yes. <laughs> and only your best one. Look, this like, dimes. I'm just laying down dimes here. Ignore all the other piles. Like, like I turn I turn the camera and like dime, 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 like a hundred perfect dimes. And I, then I get where the dimes meet the other dimes on the other side. I was like, that looks really bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. I love that's, it. That's awesome. That's the, that's the genesis of the, the uh, yeah, the, the screwdriver story is the best story. Mom and Dad said the worst thing that ever happened in the Patey home of, of things was when we figured out that the star end of the screwdriver might meet it up with a, a screw. And then everything. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And, and it's like, that's like just perfect kids gone wild story in order to get started. And, and like, uh, so we encourage each other's misbehavior in, in building and creating or destroying for, for <laughs> education's sake. Of now, course. We, we do have this silly advantage our parents talked about. It. When we learned to crawl, we learned that if you tried to open a cabinet door that was too heavy, it would run into you. But if you could open it up enough for the other one to get in, Jump in. he could help you get it open. <laughs> and so like, it, it, we have this advantage where there's two of us there. We may have split the brain. We're not that but, smart. But between us, we got this. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm going to open it. You go through. It's, it's like the absolute tag team of life. That's fantastic. Yeah, with business and everything on. So we, we, we each have our businesses, but we own a portion of each other's businesses. So we're partners in all our companies. Mm -hmm. But uh, he focuses on one and he's, he's opening the door and I'll help him out and vice versa. And it's a great, it's a great relationship. And every time one 
one company succeeds, the other one's high fiving because they're a part of it. So it's right. something we've done all the time. It's fantastic. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. So tell me how aviation came into your lives. You have all this mechanical background, all this motivation, and and obviously business success along the way in a variety of different areas. But how did yeah. it get to aviation? Business success, success, and failure. <laughs> and failure. I think it's a prerequisite, by the way. If you, if you have a, a, an army of successes, you, you you certainly have a couple that didn't work as planned or the educational phase. Oh, there's no failures. I, I take that back. We actually have this phrase, it doesn't matter if, if something if something doesn't work out, it's never a failure. It's just the, the, the best stepping stone of learning experience for the next the next path you go after. So you just keep going. I but, like that. Uh, we, we got into aviation. Um, I think this story is out there. Someone asked this before, but it was a twin moment. One of those weird twin things that people joke about or talk about in a serious or, or sarcastic way. But uh, we believe there's a connection. Uh, we don't understand it. Um, but I went to an air show. Mark did not know I went with my in-laws to Southern California to uh, uh, air show event. Mark um, was at home and uh, all of a sudden had this crazy out of nowhere bug to fly. We never talked about aviation or flying ever. So I ran um, to an airport, so yeah. looking at airplanes. So thinking, right, I need to buy one of these. Mike's thinking the same thing in California. Yeah, so I finally get, we get to the point where we had called, we call each other both excited to tell each other that we found this new idea that we wanted to learn to fly. And we both had that thought on the same day at separate oh, right. different states. Mark not knowing why he was ditching work to run into the Provo airport and wander around airplanes. He literally wandered into a flight instructor and said, how do I get my license? Got talking, the flight instructor said, well, if you wanted, you could buy this this guy selling this great 172 as a great instruction plane and it's really cheap and you can learn to fly and then sell it. So Mark, when we ended up talking, I got excited and I, I wanted to get my license and it literally went, the conversation was so fast. Mark's like, hey, if you're in, I'm in, there's a plane and I'm, I'm standing like, in front of it, right? Now. He's, I'm standing in front of the plane and I'm like, hey, I'm in 100%, go get it as low as you can and get started. So literally, by the time I got back from the event, Mark had had his first lesson, flight lesson. It was literally a one day, hey, we're gonna do it, go for it. Get a plane, start flight instruction. He had it as an introduction flight and then I, I came back and started and it and flew every day. And got his license before me, but uh, <laughs> I started first, he finished, it's all good. <laughs> it sounds like you had got your license in record time. It was pretty quick. Yeah, I don't remember. It was about as fast as you could go. I flew every single day, um, all day. I would fly sometimes multiple times a day because I first started flying. I got really motion sick, which was mm. strange to me. I, I raced. Mark and I both have raced everything you could imagine since we were toddlers. Go karts, yeah, big track. wheels to start. Hill, yeah, big wheels, <laughs> hill climbs and snow cross and motocross, and we just we've always been drag racing, nitrousing, everything we've owned. And uh, I never been motion sick, so it was really hard. I'd get motion sick, and I'd just tell the instructor, "We're going to fly until I feel like I'm going to throw up. We'll land, and we'll come back in two hours, and we'll do it again." And so I just I, I went for it every day, every chance I could. And I'd go home and I'd study until um, wee hours in the morning and do it the next day. So we we really went all in. Never looked back. I don't I don't remember how long it took to get our licenses, but Mike was definitely done before me. But I want to say I was probably four or five months, which was some time after Mike got his. He was pretty quick. But I had, I had, I want to say 128 hours, if I remember right, before I took the check ride because I did not want to do the book work. I just wanted to fly. <laughs> My instructor's finally going, I'm not going to let you fly if you don't do your book work. And I'm like, well, you're here. I'm writing the check. We can go fly it we can call it a day. <laughs> So, but uh, once Mike was taking friends and family for rides, I finally knuckled down and studied. I, you know, I, like I, I say, there's motivation. You can you can learn anything if you're motivated. Mike having a license and me not, that was pretty motivated. <laughs> now, how long did you stay? That was with, a couple months, what, maybe. Two months, uh, maybe. Well, how, how long did you stay with certified aircraft then before the same? I mean, I can see the theme, right? All the all these things you've done with other with other vehicles way outside of aviation, you get into aviation and all of a sudden there's a lot of restrictions. Yeah, so we we yeah we modified everything we ever owned, um, and it was first it was like how do we get to bigger, faster airplanes? Not really thinking about modifying it. The experimental world hadn't 
hadn't registered yet. Yeah, we weren't it, really it, introduced it was, to it. It was 172, 182, 182 210, 210, P2, P210, 421, 421 yeah. and we just kept migrating, and it would be every every few months. Piper we, Cherokee 6. Every it few was months? Was garage, Piper it Meridian. Was, I don't know how many planes we did, but 36 we, something. I don't know how many before we got into experimental, but last we, time. We basically was before. talking to our insurance agent, how many hours before we can try the next plane? It was kind of like, I want to fly everything. And if we buy it right, we found we could sell it a few months later for something similar, four months, five months later for something similar. So we'd buy it, fly a ton of hours, and then our insurance will let us get the next one, the next one. And that kind of was the process. But I think Mark launched the experimental world with an RV6. RV6A. RV6A. Yep. 180 wow. horsepower motor, a constant speed prop, and a basic panel to start, and then that didn't take long. And then you're instantly doing every speed mod that every RV guy knows about and has done. And then you start working on the things nobody has done and trying to get every last mile per hour out of it. But that was fun because if we wanted to change the cowling, you could take a good long weekend and buy you know, Monday be flying again with a not painted and not pretty, but uh, totally different design cowling. And that was kind of the, the start was the, the reality that we had the freedom. Um, if you built an airplane, you had the freedom to really play with it. And uh, right. we're modifiers at heart. So. Yeah, there must have been like a little bit of a, it must be a little kind of challenge or a place in your heart for both. Because, I mean, first of all, that's a huge leap you just described really, really quickly of going from a two two ten. A P210 to a 420 Cessna yeah. twin 421. Okay. More work to fly than any airplane we've ever yeah. owned. I mean, a, a, a big twin jet of the, I mean, the biggest jet we've, airplane we've had was a Premier Jet A1A. And that thing's nothing. That thing's so easy to fly. I mean, it's a runway hog on takeoff, on landing, especially we live at 5,000 feet. But, um, you know, ADA, we're at 4,500 feet, but DA can be 8,000 feet. That, that uh, jets can be a handful, but a Cessna 421, any of you guys out there flying big turbocharged piston airplanes, you can manage all those cylinders and turbos from melting themselves. You can fly anything. <laughs> and, uh, I've been in those. And, and with a geared engine? A geared engine. Yeah, that one, that one gave up on me. Yeah, that one tried to take Mike down. Out of it's all seats full when that thing gave up at night. What um, happened? That plane, uh, so um, I had taken that plane and it, it became the plane I kept for a long time, almost a thousand hours in that plane. Um, this is how long ago it was. There were no GPSs, and the Loran that was in it didn't work. And I flew about a thousand hours back and forth, uh, coast to coast, nonstop, all the time. Not nonstop, but but multiple times a week for work. Um, and so I, I grew up. I'm still um, often more comfortable hand flying than autopilot um, if I am on an approach but I'm getting more comfortable with autopilots. But I, I was so used to VOR to VOR for thousands of hours with no GPS, um, old school steam gauges, everything, but um, loved that plane, loved it, loved it. Um, so I decided to do a full overhaul, um, certified obviously. So we used to strip paint interior, every hose, every wire, every cable to the throttle quadrant, new RAM conversions, zero time motors, not overhauled. We got the thing looked like it came off a showroom floor. I couldn't be more excited. Oh, nicer. I think way nicer. Nice. It, was it, was, it was it was awesome. Perfect. I mean, I spin her to tell that plane. And about 200 hours, um, a gear came apart in the Gitzo side of the gearbox motor, came apart and blew the right engine. Um, I was up in the mid flight levels, up in the mid 20s. And uh, and they say it will, it will descend and then it can hold like 13,000 feet, it can't. <laughs> we, we were loaded when it went, when it done it. So it was a great single engine to, uh, we were going to California and I declared an emergency and landed in McCarran uh, International on one in the middle of the night. It's not non event, but uh, that was, that was definitely a more of a glider than it was a, a flyer on one. Uh, and they pulled the oil plug. It looked like uh, the shavings off of a CNC. That engine ate itself, it chewed up. itself apart. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, there's, there's, it's always said, and like, like Mike Bush uh, always likes to say, you know, there's something to be said for, for uh, an older engine that's got a lot of time on it than something brand new that you can break in. 
<laughs> the more you fly, the more you just like the one. You just don't know. I've had them both. I've had them both. <laughs> yeah. I, I like engines with 200 hours. I, I, I love <laughs> new engines, but I love 200 hour engines the most. <laughs> with, <laughs> I like 200 hour yeah. engines. I, I love them most. Do you want it? <laughs> no. So, we'll, we'll, so, so, so what took you to? I'm going to show a picture right now. We, uh, um, which uh, uh, was one of the ones you guys know. First of all, um, who are these guys? Uh, there. Uh, look at those <laughs> V-neck shirts. This is funny. I like oh, the, the V-neck oh, shirts. Oh, you go, you both, you're obviously spotting each other in the gym. Um, so that's that's going well. And uh, and and you, twin airplanes as well to boot. Yeah, those are uh, those were a couple of them we did. I'm uh, looking at the bumps on the cowling. So that's, that's the a twin fun. turbo era. Yeah, so that was uh, on the one behind Mike. Mike's the one without the uh, look at me printing on the front of the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if you can't laugh yourself, who the heck can you laugh at? Uh, but the bumps uh, on the cowling behind Mike there, um, uh, was for some custom intercooler mods he had done to try to bring the inlet air temps down to get a little more horsepower, boost more boost up. Yeah, that so was that a would have been turbo 550, and then I was running at the time a twin turbo Lycoming 540, which we switched over to the bigger jugs and made a twin turbo 580. So at the time, it was the only Lycoming powered twin turbo legacy around, at least wow. that we. Know. And um, that's the day before. Or we, we, so when you did the introduction, you talked about the transcontinental world speed record, which was held by Howard Hughes. Um, it wasn't actually turbulence that beat that. Mike's uh, that, records, was a, that was a turboprop. Mike's records in turboprop were for world's fastest single engine turboprop. These two airplanes here at the time, it was, uh, we broke Howard Hughes' record in formation flight with these two airplanes for fastest flight coast to coast across America for internal combustion aircraft. Oh, C1 wow. C C1C C1 category, C1C3, I believe, two, two. And that was these, and that, and that was these two guys. That was these two, and then they both eventually became eight-cylinder Lycoings. So w help me through the uh, the the progression of the different aircraft that you then you that you built. Then I'll take this one off the screen temporarily. Um, so you you went back the R you started with the RV6, went to RV10 because at this point you're pretty much in experimental world. A little bit later, think RV6A and then Zenith 801, and then and then they keep in mind there's two planes this whole time, so they're going to overlap quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. His plane, my plane, we're always right. at our own, but and we may get the order wrong. It's a problem with age, uh, <laughs> but yeah. So the but, but there's 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 some really unique uh, aircraft in that list. There's there's yeah, and none of them were stock. We, we never built a kit to the factory spec. Uh, we're like you or like a lot of experimental builders. If you, if you have some freedom, you want to exercise it and uh, <laughs> try this. So, um, but the, the legacies were, I think, it, trying to combine the, the two legacies. Well, we've had more than two legacies, but I think it was a, a a 550 and then a supercharged 550. Mike did a custom, his own supercharged design and box and intake and system. And then a 540, then twin turbo 540, and then a twin turbo 550, and then a normally aspirated 720, and then a normally aspirated 780 legacy. And then Mike did a custom supercharger on a 780 legacy. Oh uh, my God. And uh, turbulence was a whole nother re-engineer. There was another you, airframe ground up. You could you could just do the tail wrap and regular mods that you do on a legacy for the speeds. For turbulence, Mike had to, I mean, the airplane's about four feet longer, four feet wider, solid spar all the way through, added spar, second spar to help prevent wing twist at the speeds. It's gone 38, 36% larger tail. I forgot, I should let Mike tell you. But, but so just in the Lancer legacy, uh, you can see some of them right back here. Um, it's just in that there's eight, seven, seven or eight. eight. I think it's. Oh my I think god! Seven, and and you and you you blew right through it though. But but I want to pause for a second there because 
there is, there's, a, there's a lot of pilots out there who haven't even seen the eight-cylinder series of Lycomings. They don't even know that there are sevens that start in the That thing, eight cylinders firing together, it runs like a sewing machine. If Lycoming's oh. watching, I'm, I'm calling Ooh. you. We have something new we want to do. So. Yeah, we have ideas. Lycoming, you're, getting, you're awesome. getting a call from us. We love Lycoming. So. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've pushed the, the, I mean, there's a lot of great airplane craft engines out there, but if we were going to say the engine that we've pushed the hardest without it trying to take us to the ground without an engine, the Lycoming we've pushed really, really hard. Yeah, yeah it's been great, it. great for us. Got it. Well, I'll put aside my personal affinity for the Continental stuff, because of course that's what I fly behind, but uh, I hear, I I hear you. That's why Mark said there's a lot of great engines yeah. out there. <laughs> but, but Continental never made Nate cylinder. <laughs> we got to talk to him. There's a way. I'm sure we can figure it out. Let's stick a couple, a couple fours together. We'll make it work. That's that's amazing. Now, and along this list of airplanes, there's one that also jumped out at me, which is a turbine Comp Air Eight, the classic <laughs> flat, like flat sided, slab sided, made of fiber. Yeah, that, that, that kind of jumps out as not really something I would do. And and <laughs> what actually happened there is. Um, I won't get into the business side of it, but um, it through some business transactions, I ended up with a partial build of someone else's um, to uh, was given to me as payment, and um, and it was a, it, all good, all positive. Um, and um, I thought, well, you know, I can't, I I can't see. I have this addiction to finishing projects. Like, people ask me if I have it's a bad. If, 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 I, if I set a goal, do I get my planes done faster? And the answer is no, because I'm going to go 24-7. I, 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 I can't stand an undone project. So somehow I ended up with someone else's undone project. So I just grabbed that and knocked it out in a couple months and, and got it flying and then uh, played with it for like 50 hours and sold it. And it went, uh, it went into the Bahamas um, with a, well, on a set of floats and uh, started wow. doing Bahamas. Mike, if you and Chandra want to come out and spend some time in Boston, we've got a project here you can help finish. I'm sure we can knock this thing right out. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Let me finish uh, Scrappy, Draco, and the other one. Yeah, right, right after you get through all those. No kidding. So so you so you brought it up. Let ambush and Jason would love help on deception. But, uh, Mike's, Mike's pretty laser focused on his. So we got to I, I, I can imagine. <laughs> so take me through how you got all the way to Draco, which is the, the kind of the launch of the modern era of Patey aircraft. Oh my goodness! So yeah, Draco was um, came about because as I as I loved to try every new aircraft that caught my attention. Um, I have this affinity for squirrel moments with airplanes, where I'll be like, oh, I got to try that one. I need a seaplane rating. That's <laughs> it. Yeah. So like that's like literally it was like seaplanes are cool license in a month yeah <laughs> that's kind of been our, our model helicopters now we fly helicopters yeah. but, but literally I was at uh, Oshkosh and I walked by serial number one of a Wilga PZL the 2000 MA model that came out in 2006 and I was like I want it that is one big cool plane it wasn't and for sale wasn't for sale <laughs> I hounded those guys every day at Oshkosh. I walked by their booth. And by the time Oshkosh was over, I had worked my way through all the numbers to someone who finally, sorry about that, it was like my phone was late. And, uh, okay, and sorry about that. And um, I, I kind of worked through all the no's and finally found someone that gave me a maybe. And then I went back around the rounds and, and I bought it and I flew it home. I loved it. I flew hundreds, I don't know, six, 700 hours on it. Um, it was, uh, it wasn't really powered for the elevations I fly. Um, mm -hmm. a bit of, it, great for sea level, pretty anemic up high. Um, had a really hard time even clearing the high Rockies over uh, the Denver area at all. Uh, you had to go around them. And uh, so, and I finally decided to sell it. I, I always had this dream that, you know, what would make this plane, Awesome would be a bigger wing for the thinner air and this and that and the other and a great big turbine motor and I said I'll do that at some point maybe and and I sold it and literally months after I sold it they discontinued production of the 24 they had done 
and uh, it took 10 years to finally find uh, the ability to to buy uh, Wilga and, and go after it. And that's that kind of is where Draco came from was was an idea and a passion of owning a stock one and then eventually saying one day I'm going to find one and I'm going to get it back. There's only a couple on this continent, so it's not like an easy task to find. I think in the meantime, in, in, in the in meantime, the, I also kind of too, like we were, did so many other planes along the way that start I, realizing turbines don't quit you like pistons can right. and might, especially if you push them as hard as we we have. And and then I start built the Susie Zenith 801 to play in the backcountry, and we start going, you know, backcountry flying is pretty fun, you know. So yeah, so that yeah, was a big twist in itself, that's right? That's right? Flying, go buy a plane. Yeah. Rent a plane. Go, go, on the back go for a ride with a buddy with the tailwheel. They're so fun. They're awesome. Yeah, because I mean, most of the stuff that you did up until that point was sounds like it was all about speed. Now it's all about getting in, up getting slow, in tight spots. Go, yeah. low and slow. Oh, you know, and Draco was kind of like that blend. Um, it's like all the really competitive bush planes. It, it's this this phrase you hear all the time. There's always a compromise, which is 100 percent true, but you know, every time I was talking about what I want to build, I said, well, I want a bush plane that can go where but I want to lightweight cubs, but I want to fly to Alaska and I want to jump Canada without fuel and I want to do 170 knots and I want to carry four people. And, and it was like, why do bush planes have to be 120 miles an hour? Can't they be close to 200? And, and that's when I kind of said, you know what? Everyone says it's not possible and that's, that's like lighting a big giant fire because I I, I want to try. I want to see if you see it. And they may be right, but I'm going to go for it. So that's kind of where Draco came from is let's see if we can get something that can do 200 miles an hour long range and still land in a land and take off in 60, 70 feet. At one point, we yeah. just wanted a three wheeler for 850 bucks. <laughs> oh, man. We should have stuck with three wheelers there a lot less money. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you certainly didn't stop with any of that because, I mean, obviously you've got, uh, I mean, I even had backup cameras on Draco, for God's sake. You had everything going on on that thing. Yeah, we, I want to reach your comforts, no doubt. Same so tell me, about, tell me about Scrappy. Yeah, okay. Scrappy is, um, a lot of people kind of mention, Mike, Scrappy, you're, you're, uh, you're adding too much weight to be a, a competition plane. And I'm like, but first, I want it to be what I want to fly to Alaska and tour Alaska. So I want quiet, creature comfort, TV, nice heat, nice cooling, nice every upgrade I can, and night vision camera. So I'm adding weight. So will this be a, um, a plane that uh, is like a featherweight competition plane that gets uh, towed to air shows um, or trailered? No, it's not going to be that, but it is going to be a bit of a rocket ship. It's got decent power, and it's going to be what I want. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm doing some really fun, fun things with it that I've always wanted to try. And I've always wanted to have a plane that um, is designed to land the same places as all the other super planes and super competitive planes, um, with a, which may be a little more travel, a little more suspension in case there's a surprise in that tall grass. And so right. that's what that suspension is all about. May well, not you know, push the limit further, but to add buffer. Safety. Safety to those guys. And, and it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, way why, why, something why, it's cool. why not? Just because there's a five-year-old in me and he wins every time. Yeah. When, when there's a new idea, the five-year-old wins it. <laughs> but there's a fascinating lesson in this too that's amazing, which, which is obviously it must have been devastating what happened to Draco. And, and yet you bounced back from that with such – so quickly – with such a, a remarkable new passion in Scrappy. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, you know, it, this comes back to my parents. I can't say enough good about them. Um, there are a lot of struggles that we all go through in our lives. Um, we've all had them. And some are severe and some seem like yours are worse than others and vice versa. The, the bottom line is, um, there's, there's so much bad that can happen, but you're still here and there's family. And even if you have problems with family, there's friends that become your family that I just, my parents taught us a long time ago that the first thing you do is uh, stand back up, dust yourself off, stare at all the great things in life and, and let go 
of the loss and you're going to be a happier person for it and you're going to be a stronger, better person for it. And, and um, I think maybe it's over the years, it's, it's, we've had a lot of rough blows. I remember the, the, I, a really rough one for Mark and I, and it, it just is so much like the Draco experience. Um, we had built a uh, doom buggy right after the, yeah. the rabbit conversion, Mark might cry. Um, after we converted the rabbit for our daily driver, we built a doom buggy, a, a, a fiberglass body, like the ones you'd see on a beach comber. Uh, that, uh, that show was speedy. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little cartoon with that. We, yeah, we, we built one of those fiberglass body, but we put in a hopped up crazy motor in it and it could ride wheelies and, and it was a real fun um, jumper um, of a buggy we built. We were 16 when we built that. And, um, Mike one, burned it down. Yeah, whatever. So I get this. I get this call. I get this. I get this call, and uh, and they say, "Can you look outside?" And I said, "Yeah." And I was at work at a piano store, and um, and uh, I, I, Mark and I have always worked two jobs, so we were working at a construction company, and we moved grand pianos on the side. So I look up and I see this black pillowing smoke that literally went as high as you could see. The worst smoke ever. And I said, yeah, and I said, that's the doom buggy it's in the middle of the street, burning to the ground. And you, you can't imagine, like, it was like Draco. It was, it was just countless hours, thousands of hours. It was blood, sweat, and tears. Blood, sweat, and tears. Every, every penny we ever made. And every penny we didn't have. It I was mean, everything to us. And yeah. Mark and was, the first big, first big project first like ground up build of ours something that people noticed and i i would have been out um riding wheelies up the street which is totally illegal and stupid and irresponsible Looking no back. no we're, we're we were born in 72 so 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 the 80s we, were different we didn't need seat belts and we could do dumb things it was okay yeah the cops laughed they didn't we, 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 we laid in the back window of the car because all the seats were taken and no one cared yeah so i <laughs> I had been riding wheelies up the hill, and on one of the last landings, I'd come down pretty hard and didn't notice anything, but I pulled into the garage when I got out of the buggy. There was fuel going everywhere, and the fuel tank's up in the front there, and, and a line burst and, on the impact, and um, and fuel started going. There was a, a charger, battery charger on the floor. It just charged the battery with, and spark, and fire, and houses on fire. And, I was thinking about the house for myself and pushed the doom buggy out of the garage with, with fire all around my feet. And I mean, I sat out there and watched that burn. I just cried. I cried my eyes out. There's a video of Richard Holdman, which is a good friend of ours growing up. He had one of the first family in the neighborhood to have one of these cameras. And he held on the shoulder to have the separate camera, the tape deck here. And he got a video of me out there pretty upset. And I wasn't upset about the buggy. I was, I was worried about the way he he'd react to that it was gone and there's no insurance we couldn't afford insurance on that other than liability that was a tough deal so yeah you get over those quick and early and then you start realizing well it's stuff mark mark mark's still there and i i called my dad and my dad was worried he said i'm worried about mark and of course all i cared about was he was okay so you know it was just something we learned i guess and i called mark said mark don't worry about it you're okay we'll build a better one you know, let's 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 figure it out. And the know? next day, I, I was a picture. Yeah, I have a life book. I got a picture of the very next day. I mean, that thing was still stinky, burnt fiberglass. And when they say burned, burned, when they would say burned, the asphalt melted. We, it burned. The yeah. rims went down to the ground. Yeah, that the fiberglass went so the hot. Window, there was so much fuel. There was nothing left of the window. You couldn't find broken glass. That fiberglass burns hot. We learned. <laughs> But that thing was still on the side of the house, stinking up the whole stinking neighborhood of, of burnt fiberglass. And we had bought another Volkswagen Beetle. And I think before the sun had gone down, we already had the Beetle upside down. We're standing inside of it, two of us there, arms around each other, that we were taking another Volkswagen Beetle off the chassis. And we're going to shorten up that frame. We're going we're to make it even better. And it's going to ride better wheelies than before. It was way better. It was cool. That's, that's <laughs> kind of the model where we said, you know what? Back to work. Back to work. That's it. That's wow. It. What a fantastic. I mean, that 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 kind of sums up then pre preparing you for what happened or anything that ever could happen to you. Yeah, it, it it's you know, it, you got to really look out. The most important thing is the people the people around you and your friends and family and and uh, I think if there's, I I don't care about stuff 
I mean, I do. Don't get me wrong. That's really sucked losing Draco. That was a lot of work and time and heart. Um, and uh, but you know where where I feel bad the most is when I you know one day wake up and and realize maybe I didn't call my friends enough. I didn't check in on people that were struggling or or I knew we were having a hard time. And I, I think, you know, that's the area I need to be better. You know, I'm, I don't worry about whether or not I'm going to get enough work hours in a day done or buy a cool new plane or do something, you know, neat. I, I um, you know, I like that stuff, but it, it's the people that matter the most. And right. so that's what we need to focus on. Right. And so you went from that to, to Scrappy here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I keep thinking it'll fly without wings. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you, the way it looks, it very well may. <laughs> somebody somebody wrote that online. I just started laughing and said, that, don't give me ideas, because that, that taxiway between Alpha and the runway, uh, Alpha, alpha one, 1 and Alpha 2. Alpha yeah. 1 and Alpha 2. Alpha two it's one. got a pretty good sized ramp, and boy, that just looks like it'd be a hoop to hit at 60, but <laughs> I'll refrain. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, I, we'll, we'll wait for that. So what is going on with the wings? Oh, wings. So I get that question a lot. Um, right now I'm finishing up a lot of tedious little things that um, take more time than you might think. I'm doing a lot of the, but I am working on the wings as well, all in computer. The window trim, um, door trims, the cowling, plenums, um, all the stuff. The, the bottom line is I won't finalize the final design of the wing. The wing is in the computer. I've been making a lot of progress on it but I want the exact final weight. Um, I can't buy a wing. I can't make any wing that is out there work. Well, it could I. I can make it work. I could put on cub wings and a spar doubler and, and keep the weight down and, and I could fly it. But, but I need it to, to match what I want the plane to be. If I was building an all competition plane, I would make the wing loading super, super low. And this plane, though heavier with a, with a 700 pound eight cylinder up front and all the Garmin glass I have in it, um, I could still make it fly and be super competitive, but I'm, I want to size the wing so it's comfortable in flight. It's high speed and low speed. Um, and so when the plane is completely done, I'm telling everything done, then I'll take that weight and I'll make that last change on the wing size. I am doing some unique things with the wing. Um, uh, I'll just say that- That's a surprise. That, that I do have, <laughs> there, for example, there's things really? like- on the wing, I can't even, there's not even a wing spar that exists that will work for Scrappy to have the payload and useful load and G loading I want. I tried looking everywhere, so I actually am making a mold to extrude my own spars. And so there's lots of things that are, that are adding more time to Scrappy's wings. But I've always wanted a wing that can do some, be a little faster and extra slow. And so I'm, I'm trying to make a wing that can, uh, do some unique things. I'll leave it at that. And um, I've done probably 15. You're gonna, you're gonna put lights on it. Yeah, there'll be like lights okay. and stuff. They'll be amazing. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> LED lights or things. Yeah, the yeah. LEDs new, the yeah. new thing. So um, yeah, I'm gonna do some unique things. I, I've, I've done so much analysis and so many. Um, I have spent. I don't even want to admit how many hours reverse engineering all kinds of wings. And then I made a flow chart and analysis to compare wing loading of a plane with a certain airfoil and what it really did top speed, bottom end, stall, um, you know, top end. It's really neat because there's all these great uh, wing designs, but I'm finding I'm learning a lot more by analyzing how the plane actually flew in the real world and then saying, what is that wing design? Well, it's a little bit of this one, a little bit of that one. So I've been actually overlaying wings on top of wings so you can see them and then doing data to the side. So my wing is going to be um, not one that's, it's not an airfoil that um, is one that's out there. It's just a tweak of a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to do something really different with that. So I'm, that I'm pumped. It's a lot. It's, I'm putting a lot of time into the wing and it may not even work like I hope, but we're going to try it. And if it doesn't, I could build another set. <laughs> Was it was it a leap between all of the the kind of hands-on, taught yourself, mechanical aspect of doing things to to modeling the aerodynamics and the the real science of what you're doing now? 
No, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't feel like a leap. And I think it's because um, my martial engineering background, we've owned an engineering firm we sold a while ago. Um, it really came from uh, birth. I really feel like it did and everything ground up and self-taught. I, I don't know that um, we're experts at any particular field in engineering. We did school at whether it's structural, mechanical, fluid dynamics, aerodynamics, electrical, um, any of these different aspects, but we learned a lot about a lot of them. And we've been, we've been really, I think more than anything, probably just blessed with curiosity. Yeah. I, I mean, a genuine desire to, to, to want to learn why. But, yeah. Why is the, why is the thing? My mom said the, the greatest gift we were ever given and her greatest curse in life as a mother was our in, inability to stop asking why. You know, why, mom, why does this do this? And she said, well, when you're younger, she could answer. Then eventually you would say, why? Why that? Why this? Why that? And she ran out of the ability. And we started learning, well, the, the, the answer to the question why is the, the funnest treasure hunt you'll ever be on. And yeah. if, you, if, you look at, if you look at why it's the best question you can ever ask to get the best education you could ever get, there's nothing more motivating than, than ferreting that out yourself. And aviation has been one of those areas that we get to keep learning and making mistakes and hopefully not any, any devastating ones, just, you know, expensive ones, but nothing, nothing that matters, you know? Yeah. I, I think, um, I think so kind of summarizing it, it's, it doesn't feel like a big leap because there's really not been a project our whole lives that we already knew what to do. It was more, how do we expand on what we have and then go learn more. So there's, when I dove into modifying wings for my race planes and things, I analyzed every high speed wing I could find in existence and how they really worked compared to what the engineer thought it would do. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I think kind of diving into scrappy, it just feels similar. We mm -hmm. want to, Wanted a doom, we wanted a dune buggy that could ride wheelies and still go out and smoke a, a hot rod bed at the time, you know? And, and, and so those are the things that make it fun is, you know, right. how, how do we just push all directions? And, and then um, we take advice from anybody. Like I, I we are good listeners. We, we will may talk a lot and even <laughs> over top yes. of each other from time to time, <laughs> but we, we, we do love people's input. It's, yeah. There's a lot of lot of really really smart. There's a lot of people out there way smarter than Will ever. I, I can honestly say like, we're good listeners. We we, we have learned um, a long time ago. We will listen to the guy who is the absolute expert at a given field, and then we'll say and, why, and, and then and then, then he'll, he'll give the answer like <laughs> that is the only answer. And I will listen to him exactly like the guy who knows nothing and throws out an idea that may be the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But I'll go, huh, let's think through why maybe that isn't dumb as far as I can push it. And then the guy that should be right, I want to look at him equally and say, what is, how far can I push this to prove it's right or wrong or learn from? And it, it's, it's searching for those answers that usually helps you understand that there's a guy, there's a reason why he's an expert and you listen to him, but you now – by questioning it, you learn why that is the answer. And then same with some of the crazy ideas. Those crazy ideas is why I do some fun things on, on airplanes that may not make sense. Scrappy was not built as a practical aircraft. I think one of the first videos I said, this aircraft is not practical. It still drives people nuts. <laughs> it's not practical. Why would you I do that on a push plane? Oh, well, it's because it's, it's going to be plane. fun. It's going to be fun. So Because you can. As I can, let's go do it. <laughs> so we got some secrets, some cool things on Scrappy. We'll we'll put out some videos. I'm way behind on videos, but uh, we'll we'll get some stuff out. There's some really fun things I'm doing on Scrappy. I'm excited to show everybody. It's really oh, I can't wait to see that. My five year old one on a couple of them, and we're gonna do something fun. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! I cannot wait to see that. Now I want to talk for a, a second now about uh, what you've done with Best Tugs. And uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, there's, there's innovation in technology, and there's innovation in, in business, obviously, and I, I am in awe of what you have done because I'm a, I'm a student of business. I love it as just watching it and appreciating what people do. And 
I think of what you've managed to do with taking something that that it's it's a tug, you know, and turning it into amazing technology, but also a brand and a and a following and 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 an art around it. It's almost it, the only thing I can even come up with that's even similar is maybe what Dyson managed to do with you know vacuum cleaners or hair dryers or fans, like to take something that that is that people consider normal and all of a sudden it's not anymore. It's like Museum of Modern Art, something totally different. How did how did this come about, and how did you add the 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 flavor to it uh, to take it in that direction? Uh, you know, um, I guess the short answer is um, Mike and I we we've had a lot of airplanes, and we're kind of passionate about aviation and general aviation, and we always wondered why it was we're pushing million dollar airplanes around with farm equipment. Um, I had significant damage to a meridian because I advanced a throttle too quick on a tug and the damage was 10x what that tug cost me and that that bit and my wife damaged the wheel pants a couple times on her Cirrus and I thought these were we're moving airplanes around with and we tried a bunch of different brands and so of course being the guys that want to modify and make stuff, we're like, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? We never had time, but when we owned Prodigy Engineering, where our background was hybrid electric vehicles, smart digital controllers, um, and we thought, why, why, if we can move people and freight down the freeway safely, um, and we have all this technology, why aren't we putting that technology and leveraging it to better handle our, what for many people is our most prized possession and one of the most expensive things alone, including a lot of times more money than the house they live in, and that's the airplane, and so. After we sold Prodigy Engineering, they said, you cannot, we will not compete with the Patey brothers on electric cars, trains, buses, or boats. And so we immediately followed up, well, how about smart aircraft moving equipment? And they literally said, well, who gives a beep about that industry? And I think both of us were like, shut your mouth. We're <laughs> 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 a little bit passionate about yeah. it. So we made them put it in writing and, um, and we started making what we thought would be a smarter, better looking, funner, safer aircraft moving equipment with a primary goal of the, to help our kids learn how to build the company. Um, we never expected it to take off the way it has. We're super, super grateful. We still don't do any paid advertising or marketing. Our business, we have the best customers in the world. I think last um, customer survey we did for the last three months was 93.8% um, referral. That's so I've never had a business like that. This, we're just so grateful that the aviation community likes what we've done and we'll keep trying to do better and we keep listening to them. And I think we have a major improvement on almost every product line every six months. And um, so, well, and we'll keep trying to do that. It's kind of fun. We still ask ourselves when we got a tug like the Romeo you're showing there, we're like, when we built that, that was the best tug you could build for a remote control tug. And, you know, I look back at them now and go, why did we do that? Let's change it. Why, why did we change it to that? Let's change it again. And, and that's the evolution. You know, if you can keep asking yourself why and don't get stuck on your old ideas as being the best ones, you learn and grow and listen to your customers. And fortunately, it's worked out. And we, we, have, we have amazing customers. Our, uh, I, I'm telling you, it, Aviation to us is, is our family, our, it's our second family. And um, the people that buy from us are genuinely are just friends and peers and, and people we look up to and are, are just so excited to, to work with them and, and sell them a product and service a product. And, and um, it's just, it, it, we feel like every time we, we get a new customer, we got a new member to our family. And, and, um, and then every time someone comes up and says, I fly a 172 or a Cardinal, we meet another member of our family. It doesn't matter what you fly, if it gets you two inches off the ground and a smile on your face, you're in my family. Yeah, we, we, we get <laughs> each other. It's just, aviation's a special club. So That's absolutely fantastic. And obviously, we can't wait for ours to show up. So, I mean, I agree. And the well, style, you. again, that's put into it. Appreciate it. It is it, really impressive. Now, you have some other products also coming out. Yeah, we couldn't help it. <laughs> so... We thought if we can make something that'll lift up to the, the brand, we would try it. And there's a few things in aviation. We've looked at what's out there and went, you know what? They're doing a fantastic job and we don't have a better idea, so we won't we'll leave it alone. And some other things were like, you know what? We can bring some more technology or some more thought into that. And, and Best Power is a new uh, product line for us, the Best Power Supplies. We've got 
best power is GPUs, best power start packs coming out. The, the best power GPUs are ground power units. We're shipping now. Um, the start packs are coming real close as well, and we'll do larger and larger units there. And so, um, yeah, thanks for thanks for showing that. But but we just barely put those on our website. We've been shipping them for almost four months now because we put a little tease on Facebook, and the orders kept coming in, and people started referring them to avionic shops have been amazing they're, they've been telling people if you're going to get a power supply get one from best tugs and and they understand what makes it different you know dual filtering and and um clean energy and and load following in real time why that matters to sensitive avionics and they're telling the stories for us and so um now that we finally started catching up on the orders from the initial release the um we're we put it on our website now the sales Went up again so <laughs> now and and what's this monster coming this is the new one um we have not shown this so but i i wanted to show it now because we have been shipping them and this is the best scrubbers um we've got some hangers and we don't like cleaning but we like them to be really clean and sexy <laughs> and we've had enough challenges with enough scrubbers that over the years we've been making notes. We've been working on the best scrubber for almost three years now. We've been wanting to release this for a long time. So we have two product lines out. They're shipping now. I think we shipped three today. Um, and we have a, a single head scrubber um, that uh, is a pad assist, meaning that the brush on the front help pulls it across the floor. And then we have a dual head that's motor driven. And on both those units, we came up with 21 different things that make us better than what's been on the market. And they're uniquely designed from, from rotor selection, the chemicals we use, um, even the battery type we picked is scrubbers in a hanger don't get used very often. And you use a regular scrubber, you're gonna be replacing batteries so often you wanna pull your hair out. So everything from battery selection, the slope in the tray, motor selection controllers, to try to make a scrubber live up to the brand. And, now our hangar floors are much prettier. Yeah, you think, <laughs> I'll mess it up. I'll mess it up. You think about how much money we spend to paint a floor or polish it. And I mean, on a small hangar, you can easily spend $10,000. And then two months later, it looks like crap. But with a good scrubber, this is my pitch. Thanks for letting me do this. <laughs> you can spend a little money on a scrubber and have a brand new floor every time you decide to get out there and let it do the work for you. So. Take and really, isn't it like isn't it like pulling a thread on a sweater anyway? Because you go and you get a tug, and then all of a sudden, now you're like, yeah, the tug looks great, but the floor looks crummy, and then you fix the floor, and then you're like, well, now, but now the floor's dirty again. <laughs> <laughs> and now we need more. Now we need more planes. I mean, it's one thing after another. Anything to get people to buy more airplanes. We're in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> airplanes, and we don't have any intention to make airplanes, but if we can grow general aviation, then it's we all win right it's that is exactly why we're here and thanks for taking us back to the beginning i, yeah. I definitely appreciate it uh, mark and mike it's been so fantastic having you we could talk for absolute hours i um, i hope you'll join us again on the show at some point in the future i want to talk about the other things you've got going on new developments coming up with you there's other aircraft way more than we have time to do i'd love to have you back on the show uh, we'd love to be back Thanks so yeah, much for having us. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much, Mark and Mike Patey, and everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening. And as always, do everything that you can to help support general aviation. All the partners that help make social flight possible, we are all here in this together. We're trying to keep our community together and have it be as strong as possible, not only when the pandemic ends, but well in advance and well beyond all of those things. And think of your local airport, local FBO, and local airport restaurant. Everything that we can do to support small businesses and large ones during the just general aviation challenge is good for everyone. So again, thank you so much. Thanks to Mark and Mike. I, Mike, I appreciate it so, so much you taking the time out of your evening to join us here. And I wish you all blue skies.